Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta, and in Butte, Montana, or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. That's right. We want to thank Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. While you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping, your first three years, a quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a new quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinator insects, both wild and managed, before they disappear. The magazine is full of beautiful photos and informative articles. Learn more on our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor and our new guest co-host, Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Hey, Kim, have you ever used WebMD on the internet to, to, to figure out what why you feel the way you feel? I have not. I've, I've never even heard of it, so that tells you what I know. <laughs> well, the internet is a... No, you meant WebMD, not the internet. Never mind. So, <laughs> had you heard about Web uh, BMD? Well, it's kind of like WebMD, but for beekeepers to use while they're looking at their bees. Today's interview is with Dr. Jamie Ellis, who, along with others, got the BMD.com up and going. It's really cool. I've heard a little bit about it, but I, I haven't, I've yet to experience it, and I'm waiting for him to tell, him, tell us about it. You know, uh, uh, Jamie and I go back a ways. Mm-hmm. I knew him when he was a grad student at the Georgia Bee Lab. Him and he and Jennifer were working. He was working on small hive beetle, and Jennifer was working on a whole variety of projects. So I got to know him a little bit then, and I've bounced around a couple times with him since he's been in Florida. Well, very good. I, it's a it's a fun project. I think we first heard about it when we were talking to the Pollinator Plus uh, Pollinator Partnership uh, folks, and uh, it's 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 a good app. Well, what's going on in your bee yard? You know, I've had three weekends in a row where it didn't rain. (laughs) I'm I'm wondering what's wrong. Uh, So I've been able to pay some attention to the bees and the bee plants that I'm growing for them. Uh, But uh, the the two of the three colonies I got are doing really great. One of them, uh, it's just poking along. And, you know, if it wasn't, I'd be disappointed if there wasn't something wrong somewhere. (laughs) Yeah, it always seems to be one in the outfit that's yep, causing yep. causing problems. Yeah, and I'm minor seem to be doing really good. We're getting ready to have our uh, well here in the Pacific Northwest, or at least in my area corner of the Pacific Northwest. We our last our last honey flow of the season seems to be the blackberry, or the brambles, or the blackberries, and those. And are, that's like right now. That's right now, right? Yeah, just about. Uh, I've been checking the the buds. The buds are about ready to burst but they're not out yet and then it'll be like two weeks of honey flow and then everything dies so it's going to be interesting to uh i'm hoping that everything this is my chance to make honey this year so hopefully fingers crossed <laughs> oh good luck we're we're in the middle of berry bloom right now it's uh, everywhere you go you can see the white flowers in the in the bushes and uh, several other things are blooming now, and that's why I was out this weekend putting on supers. So we got beekeepers here I'm talking to our, our friend Buzz, who's making honey already. He's, he's, he's ready to go. So Those were the days. I remember them well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, get into our interview with uh, Jamie Ellis and see what he has to say about the WebMD.com. Well, we have with us now Dr. Jamie Ellis. Jamie, welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's good to see you again, Jamie. It's been too long. 
It has been. I know all of our meetings canceled. It seems like we may yep. not overlap here in a couple months still, probably. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Well, we have you here to talk about the WebMD. That's a great program, a great project. Um, so for our listeners who don't know much about it, why don't you give us a little bit of background of how it started, what it is, and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. So um, some colleagues and I were at a Be Health meeting. I, at this point, I hesitate to even guess, eight or 10 years ago. And it's funny, we, we all seem to arrive at the similar idea, uh, idea simultaneously. We're all familiar with the WebMD, where you can go online and you can diagnose what's happening to you. And it's only as good, of course, as the information that you put into it and the background algorithms to help you find that. But I had been thinking about something similar for bees and bee colonies, with the idea that a beekeeper could go in and, and check certain things that they're seeing in their hive, and then the BMD suggest to you what you might be seeing. And so some colleagues and I were discussing this at this health meeting some years ago and very quickly put a team together and it, and it kind of manifested into the online tool that we have today. Very good. And, and, and that's the BMD, not BMD. That's right. It's the BMD. If you, if you type in the B-E-E-M-D.com into your search, engine or into your web address bar, it's going to go to the right website. And you'll know that you're there when, when you get to that page and there are things that look like parts of a bee colony as well. And of course, you scroll down to the bottom of that, you can see all the institutions who are involved. I uh, took a look for the first time uh, today, Jamie. I just learned about this. Uh, Jeff, somebody mentioned it in one of the recent programs we did, and I had not heard of it before. So I went and took a look. And uh, um, on the front page, you've got a host of people who are supporting this. I'm, I'm really impressed with the gathering of knowledge that you guys have put together. Yeah, it's it's really impressive. Let me let me give you a little bit of background on who the team members were and then how it kind of grew over time. So when I was at that meeting that I alluded to earlier, I, I was, was talking with Dennis Van Inglesdorp from the University of Maryland. I was speaking to Robin Rose, who at the time was working for USDA APHIS. And then she kind of roped in Debbie Delaney, who's at the University of Delaware. And we kind of got together subsequent to that meeting to talk about developing the site. And so Robin Rose, who, again, was at APHIS, decided to chip in some funding. And, of course, Dennis representing the, the Be Informed Partnership, NAPSE, the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, became aware of it and quickly became funding partners, as well as the Pollinator Partnership, et cetera. And so with those funders as our background, the University of Florida, University of Delaware, and University of Mar Maryland, my, my team and I, my colleagues, we decided to start doing the work. And the work was difficult. The way, it, <laughs> the way that we had envisioned it originally is that a beekeeper should be able to go to this website and get to any condition that their colony might be experiencing. And those conditions include healthy colonies. You know, sometimes beekeepers are seeing things that are in fact okay. And I think sometimes it's good for them to be told that they're okay. So, so the very first order of business after we had the team and the sponsors was to create an Excel spreadsheet that had everything we could imagine seeing in a colony across the top and every named condition we could imagine across the leftmost column. And so we would go by condition and say, with American fowl brood, what are all of the things we can imagine seeing with that? With a queenless colony, what are all the things that we can imagine seeing with that? And we did this for everything that we could think of. My team and I did it. The, the BIP folks did it. Debbie did it um, at University of Delaware. And we hashed this thing out and ultimately produced this Excel sheet that Debbie then took and with her team put together the background that we're seeing at the bmd.com. Well, it's pretty impressive. There's an awful lot of detail there. Uh, and I think one of the things that impressed me the most was how you sorted them out. If I was a rank beginner and, and didn't really know what I was seeing, I didn't know the questions to ask, um, your program kind of solves that for me. You know, Kim, it's funny. The, the original uh, uh, vision for this is, again, if you think back to the WebMD, the, the thing that gave this idea originally, 
if, if you go to that website, or at least in the website at the time, they would show, you know, Leonardo's the Peruvian man where he's standing up. And if you just hover over a body part like the head, it would highlight and then it would tell you conditions or symptoms associated with the head. And then you check everything that you were experiencing and then it would suggest to you what you may or may not have. So the original idea for the BMD is that we put up uh, a fictitious or cartoon-esque colony that people could hover over. Is it happening inside the hive, outside the hive, et cetera? And what we settled on after some significant thought and gentle debate was just putting <laughs> up what you see on the homepage. You know, is it happening with the adults? Is it happening with the brood, the colony, the honey, inside the hive or outside the hive? So when a user goes to the bmd.com, they're presented these images and then they will they will click on the image where what they are seeing is happening. And once they click mm -hmm. on example, adult bees, if they see it as a condition associated with adult bees, they'll click on adults and then they'll be presented a list that they can check everything they're seeing, you know, crinkled wings, bees crawling around on the grass outside of the hive. And of course, the more information they're able to add, the better the, the resolution on their answer. And so once they've clicked everything that they're seeing and they press, you know, diagnose condition, they will be given a list of things that might be responsible for what they're seeing. Of course, what I just described, for example, is, is similar to what we would expect to see with deformed wing virus. So it might say, you know, deformed wing virus is a 75% match. Um, you know, tracheomites is a, or 50% match and so on. And so then once you get to that point, you're, you're able to say, okay, here's what the computer is suggesting it may be. Let me read the descriptions provided about these things and see if it matches what I'm seeing. And again, the whole point is just to help beekeepers get down to a diagnosis for what may or may not be happening in their highs. And so, yeah, it's a lot of thought started at the home page. Can we keep this simple? Can we help people get where they need to go quickly? And of course, there are some improvements we want to make, but but generally speaking, it's pretty good at getting down to where we think. I, I often go online and say, I want to try to stump it this time. I'm going to describe, I'm, I'm going to pretend that I'm seeing American foul brood. I'm going to click on a few things and I'm going to see if it gives me that as an answer. And, and I'm always surprised that almost always puts what I'm thinking foremost in, in the answer list. And that's the idea is to help beekeepers figure out what's happening in their colonies. Well, it was pretty impressive. <clears throat> Can I do this on my cell phone when I'm standing in front of a colony? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, that makes it even easier rather than trying to have to remember when I run home and get out of my computer. So that's good. You can do it. How much does it cost me to do this? Well, it's absolutely free, Kim. And I want to I want to expand on your, your, your comment there. One of the things that we were nervous about is that we didn't want people to have to see what they're seeing and then run home and get on, on yeah. their computer to know. You know, we want them to have their cell phones with them and say, well, I'm, I'm out here in the field. Can I click on this and make it and make it good? So it's supposed to be mobile friendly, right? They'll go to the website, the bmd.com. It's supposed to be mobile friendly. The other thing that we tried to do is we tried to make sure that once they click on where it's happening, adult bees, brood, colony, and what have you, when it gives you a list of conditions to check, we tried to match pictures to those conditions so that people could hold their cell phone by what they're seeing in the field. Yeah, that is, that is a bee with crinkled wings. That's exactly what I'm seeing. And they would know to check that. And, and again, you know, once they do this in the field or back at home from memory, it's completely free. That was very important to us is make this a free resource. And it's funny, I, for, I forget Kim or, or Jeff, one of you mentioned you weren't necessarily even aware of it until someone brought it up. That's, <laughs> that's because so much work went into it over so much time, there never was a formal rolling out of this program. And now, now it seems proper to, to announce to the world that this thing exists, that it's free, and that it's something beekeepers can use as a tool to help them understand what may or may, or may not be happening to their colonies. I hear a drum roll in the back there, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> That's what we intended. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Well, I'm glad that uh, we're able to help you uh, introduce this thing. Uh, for our listeners, and it's free, and I can do it. Any downsides at all, other than you'd like to add more, I'll bet? 
Yeah, you, you've actually just hit the nail on the head. That's the downside is we obviously want it to go, you know, further. And, and there are images, for example, that we do not have. I, I mentioned to you, once you say it's on the adults or in the hive or associated with honey, and you're given that list of things to check, there are some some conditions or some things that one would see for which we don't have images. And one of the things that we're hoping to ask the users in the future is if you, for example, um, let's say multiple eggs per cell. If, if we don't have an image for that, we would love our users to be able to send that to us so that we can populate each thing that a beekeeper might encounter with a number of images associated with that so that they're not comparing you know, a varied condition to one stock photo that we may have online. So we'd love to increase our photo library. Mm-hmm. We'd also like to be able to you know, in the future, people submit images and, and us be able to use that for diagnostic purposes as well. So it, the beauty of this thing is its simplicity. You know, it's not not many clicks before you get where, where we hope that people are going. And, and I think the icing on the cake was once we had developed all these conditions and, and this this algorithm to get you to where we, we hope it's supposed to go, we needed text support so that people could say, hey, if I'm seeing the form wing virus, what can it tell me about that? And that's when we brought o- over, you know, world famous bee scientist, um, Dewey Karen, who then wrote and provided a lot of the descriptive text that you will see once you get down to your condition. So it really, you know, a lot of thought and a lot of work went into it. And now it just needs to be used and, 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 uh, improved. Well, let's hope, uh, all of our listeners get out there and use this thing so that uh, it gets used and they get better. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really important that we promote reliable and trusted sources of information for our listeners to re- go to. I'm always amazed at the the amount of inaccurate information that's out there. The uh, old old tales and old approaches. Uh, without a whole lot of research behind it. So I'm really excited to be able to make uh, the BMD known to our listeners and encourage folks to use it. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. You know, essentially, all the people involved, and, and now, you know, Olav Ruppel's involved as well through NAPSI, all, all the people involved, Dennis, Debbie, myself, Olav, others who have, who you know, Dewey, who have put their effort into this page, we all essentially have an extension mandate where our job is to provide or develop tools and provide reliable science vetted information. You know, is is the BMD perfect at the moment? It's not, you know, we, we need more information to help people get where they're going. Is is the WebMD perfect? I mean, how many of us have self-diagnosed the problem that, that we were wrong about? But But I do believe over time, the improvements will happen. I, I think it's a really good starting place and already a really good tool for beekeepers. And I, I'm excited these days when I go and speak to local bee clubs, it's one of the things I'm now highlighting. I've just kind of started highlighting it this year and people are excited to know that it exists. Yeah, it's really good. Where, where do you see it going? Uh, you, you mentioned you want to get more, some more pictures. You want to provide perhaps some, uh, being able to upload a picture maybe to for a diagnosis. What else? Where else do you see this being in, in a year? Well, I tell you, in, in a year, there may not be significant differences except maybe a better photo library. But I do believe, and, and I'm putting myself out on a limb here because my colleagues and I have not spoken about this, but I do believe that we are getting awfully close to having the the technology necessary where people can upload images and through machine learning, you know, the machine actually recognize what's in the image and, and suggest to you what you may or may not have. And so that's an exciting prospect to me. Something like the BMD would be a great tool through which to run such a program. So I think there's lots of opportunities to bring in substantial technology and improve upon even the, the very simplistic structure that we have here. What about a an, an app specific to the BMD? Yeah. Jeff, that's a good point. We talked a lot about the app. Um, one of the tricks about apps is they're somewhat expensive at the moment to yeah. develop, and we really wanted to make sure that this was free and available to all. So right now it's essentially a web app, which is when people use their phones, even in the field or in their own line, for example, hit their homes, they're still in both cases going to the BMD.com. I personally would love to see it be an app, but that will take 
um, more more financial input to get yeah. it there. I've heard rumors of it costing fifty to a hundred k just to make it an app, but that is certainly something I would personally love to see happen. Wow! So if any of you out there are listening and just happen to have fifty <laughs> to a hundred k in your pockets, I, I know I know that we can <laughs> turn an already good tool into an incredibly good tool. You might you might have received some positive response to that before, like say February twenty eighth or so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if, and now that required minimum distributions have been pushed back a little bit, people aren't having <laughs> it's not as free flowing money. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Well, I can, I can see a future with this. Yeah, uh, financing is obviously an issue, but I can see a future for this program where I can take my phone, take a picture of what I'm seeing, hit hit the right series of buttons, have your program identify what I've got, and then tell me what to do about it. That's key, Kim. We we absolutely talked about that, this idea of how important is it to get people to the point of, I'll use the word diagnosis. Diagnosis, though, implies that it's always bad. Like I said, sometimes the condition can be your colony is okay. But this idea, how important is it to get them to the diagnosis and the remedy and one of the things that I'd like to see improved upon is how to address what you're seeing. Because at the moment, we don't have the remedy in place. We just have a diagnosis. And I think some of the hesitation originally was if this thing you know, suggests five things that are equal candidates for what you're seeing and beekeepers act upon one and two, but it happens to be four and five, you could still uh, suffer significant colony issues you know, if you're addressing the wrong thing. And so I think there was a little hesitancy to get to the diagnosis, but I think that is certainly one of the ways that it could be improved over time is, is not just telling you what it, what are good chances that you have in that colony, but actually how to address it once you are able to match it to this condition. And then you'd have to, when you download that app, you'd have to say, okay, I live in Ohio, so I have to obey this set of rules and regulations. You live in Florida, you've got a sure. different set. Um, but that, I, I can see where that would, I mean, right now, every time I turn on my phone, it wants to know where I am. So uh, that wouldn't be that hard to do. Yeah, I people I think would get a little nervous if we were tracking to their bee yards using the apps. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? That's certainly You, you never know with uh, today with the... Uh, even the recent release from those people with Apple phones and other phones where they're releasing APIs for, for your proximity tracking for the COVID issues. So you never know what where you're being tracked or how. Yeah, you know, it's pretty mind boggling, Jeff, but <laughs> I could go on for days about that. But you're, you're absolutely right. One of the things that we need to ensure our users is that uh, there, there's no capturing of their data. They're just going online, pushing enter, and that's that. It's all done and gone. So, yeah. Well, I like I like the fact that it's web based. Uh, even if you had a, a tablet, many of the tablets these days have Wi Fi connectivity or cell connectivity. That you even so if you're constrained by the small picture sizes on your cell phone, you could take a like an iPad out and uh, and, and connect and use it there as well. Absolutely. Yep. That's that's the goal is to put a tool in the hands of the beekeepers right at the at the spot that they need it. Yeah, I know Jamie's got a lot more going on at his Florida lab. Uh, before I left the magazine, I was looking at pictures of the brand new buildings and some of the programs that are getting started up. Yeah, Kim, uh, <laughs> I'm I'm chuckling because one of the things that uh, it's difficult it's difficult to put it all in a nutshell. My team has grown and grown and grown, and there's a lot of us now, and there's a lot going on. But I can certainly give you a very brief synopsis of some of the things that we're doing at the lab. So I, I work at the University of Florida, which I'm I'm sure is apparent maybe as, as I'm introduced for your listeners. Um, I work in a really large entomology and nematology department. I believe it's the largest in the United States. We have about 70 professors in the department. I'm the guy who focuses on honeybees. And you are correct. The Florida State Beekeepers Association with donors and the University of Florida and the state legislator and other um, par par partnering groups came together to fund a brand new honeybee research and extension laboratory for me and my team on campus at the University of Florida. 
It's over 16,000 square feet of space. There's three buildings associated with it. And of course, the research apiary, in addition to all the research apiaries that we already have scattered around Gainesville. And one of the things that I'll mention is that University of Florida is a land-grant institution. That means we have responsibilities in three things, research, teaching, and extension. And so my team and I do research projects focused on honeybees. We teach students at the University of Florida uh, honeybee-related information, and we do extension. And so just a very super brief overview of some of the things we have going on in those three areas. In research, we focus a lot on honeybee husbandry, which is all this, you know, keeping of bees alive, honeybee health, diseases, pests, pesticides, nutrition. If it's something that affects a beekeeper's colonies, it's under that category. We also do a lot of um, ecology and conservation work with honeybees. And then the third area is integrated crop pollination. We'll have somewhere in the neighborhood 30 to 40 active research projects at any given time. In instruction, uh, Cameron Jack, Dr. Cameron Jack, who was recently hired to work at the University of Florida, now teaches more courses on honeybees at the University of Florida than I think there are anywhere else in the nation. Um, by the time he finishes developing his instructional program, there'll be seven to eight different courses on honeybees and beekeeping. Essentially a beekeeping one, beekeeping two, practical beekeeping, commercial beekeeping, honeybee biology, Diseases and Pests of Honeybees, and Study Abroad course, courses on Asian apiculture and apis diversity. Mm -hmm. So it's an amazing place. Uh, if you want to learn about bees as a university student, it's an amazing place to come. And a lot of those courses are online completely and taught every semester. Just in our Beekeeping 101 course, we have nearly 200 students in it every semester. And people from all over the world can take this course for college credit because it's completely online. Our, our department, we, we are pioneers in offering education, entomological ent education through completely online. And then, of course, in our extension branch, we have uh, extension programs, bee colleges, master beekeeper program, which is entirely online. It's growing at leaps and bounds now. We do our own podcast, Two Bees in a Podcast, informational documents, videos. We travel the country. We travel the world talking about bees. We answer thousands of emails and phone calls a year. We're in the field with beekeepers. So, you know, with an extension, we're trying our best to train beekeepers in as many ways possible. And, you know, I... I I get a lot of credit, but really it's all my team. We've got a great team here at the University of Florida, and there's a lot of us. Just, just last year in 2019, we had over 50 undergraduate volunteers in the lab, yeah. just volunteers. So we probably have 20 to 30 employees or volunteers at any given time working on honeybee research, extension, and instruction. So we're quite excited about the growth of our program, the future of our program, and hopefully the ability for us to help beekeepers and address the sustainability of beekeeping moving forward. Well, it sounds like you're not having a problem keeping busy. Yeah, you know, there's no shortage of work. In fact, I'm kind of an ideas guy. I always come up with, I think, <laughs> pretty good ideas. And that, the, the problem is, is just the volume of people it takes to pull some off. And of course, it, it all, I hate to say this, but it all boils down to money. When you have money, you can have stellar extension research and teaching programs and a big, great team. And when you don't have money, you can't. So grants, you know, that's it. Just all it all rolls into where, where, how, how do you get funding? That's that's true. It all comes down to that eventually. Just like everything else in life, unfortunately. Kim, it is. But, I tell you, it's it's it's. I was telling one of my technicians yesterday. It's a feedback loop. The more beekeepers you help the more who want to be in your extension programs and will pay to do it. The more money you make that way, the bigger you can make your extension team. The bigger you make your extension team, the more beekeepers you can help. The more beekeepers you can help, the more who will sign up for your programs. The more who sign up for your programs, the bigger extension team. It's just, it's a feedback. Loop. The same is true with research and, and teaching. You know, the more successful you are in those three things, the more resources come in, the more you can be more successful. And so, we are do we we estimate that we help uh, millions of people every year through our our releases, our press releases, our interviews, our podcasts, our our documents online. It's pretty incredible the reach that we've been able to have, and we're very fortunate to be able to do it at the University of Florida. 
One of the things you mentioned was your uh, master beekeeper program. That's brand new that you're just rolling out. Is that correct? So, Jeff, yeah, we've we've had a master beekeeper program nearly since I've been at the University of Florida for about 13 years. And a few years ago, my team and I really wanted to move our program online. And there were a couple of reasons for this. Number one, if it's face to face, you're limited on the number of people you can help. You're limited based on the amount of time it takes to help them. But if you move it online, anybody on planet Earth can take it at any moment and it's accessible everywhere. So that instantly brings up the common critique about online programs, which is, well, how can you learn anything online? And I will tell you, you know, Jeff, Kim, that's true of my generation up, right? Through, through our collective yeah. generation, we might struggle online, but today's individuals learn as well online as they do in face-to-face. And so we've got a four-level program. Our level one, our apprentice level is completely online. Our level two will be completely online in about a month. So that's our advanced level. Our level three, our master level and our master craftsman level will be online fully by the end of the year. And, and the beauty of our program, unlike a lot of other people's online programs, is people can start it when they want to. A lot of other people who run online master beekeeper programs treat it almost like a university course where it starts January 1st and it goes until May 15th. Well, that's not us. You, you can jump in and out of it at, at no required pace whenever you want to. And I'll add you know, a couple more points, perhaps the most important of which, we worked with professional adult online education specialists to develop the content in a way that people best learn. So we're mm-hmm. trying to match it to objectives. You know, we're matching it uh, appropriately for our target audience. We have an instructional designer who puts all of this together. And we're, you know, it's, it's the, the online rollout has only been within the past year, but it's already receiving a lot of attention and we expect it to, to grow exponentially in the future. We're quite excited about it. It's, it's funny. It's cost me a small fortune just to get it to this point. So that's, that's the whole point of, you know, when you're, when you're bringing in money, you can do great things. And when you do great things, you bring in money. And when you bring in money, you can do great things. So it's just kind of, <laughs> this kind of feedback loop, but, but we, we are excited about where it's going and where even where it is, or, but but I certainly am looking forward to seeing where it goes even more in the future. It's been getting some good press, so that's that's good to see, good. good to hear from you. You know, I tell you, I'm, this is this is the way I explain it to beekeepers, and some may believe me or some may not. But I'm a full professor now, so there are no more promotions for me. I've I've been promoted to where I can be promoted, and so there's no stress, there's no anxiety. All I have to do is what I want to do, and what I want to do is help beekeepers. And so at this point in my career, we are focused on trying to provide tools for beekeepers to address beekeeper needs and to listen to them. For example, in our research program, I just hired about two years ago an individual whose only job is to ask commercial beekeepers in Florida what they want studied and then to go and study that. So my point is, is we are trying to build a system at UF that is beekeeper driven through our teaching program, through our extension program and through our research program. And it's, it's been kind of an uphill battle because let's, let's face it, you know, commercial beekeepers aren't necessarily used to that. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's been an uphill battle, but we, we're working our rear ends off at UF to try to turn that around, at least in Florida to see if we can't provide some tools and, and guidance and partner with them to address some of these issues that none of us can do by ourselves. I can see, I can see where that, uh, could go. And and immediately I'm listening to you. And the, the first question that came to my mind is you're studying beekeeping in Florida. Can you move that across the border? And can you talk about wintering in Montana or uh, migratory beekeeping in Northern California or the, 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 the do I dare say it, the murder hornet? Uh, in Washington. So, so Kim, a- absolutely. I mean, obviously, we're we're a unique state, right? Most states can claim the same thing, right? Every state's different. We're unique. We're hot all the time. Um, it's beekeeping's different down here than it is in much of the rest of the country. But Kim, what I would tell you to, to your question is one quarter of the nation's bees pass through Florida every year. So even if we aren't 
in Wisconsin teaching people how to overwinter bees or in Northern California teaching people how to avoid, you know, drought or whatever. We are teaching the beekeepers who go to those areas and experience those things and share that knowledge with others. So we are trying very hard to develop our program in such a way that we meet the needs not only in Florida, but also nationally. And for that matter, Kim, internationally, you know, we, we, our extension programs are growing to the point that we're trying to put knowledge that would be relevant to beekeepers in Germany and the UK and Australia. We know we've got listeners on our podcast, for example, from those places. We know people follow us on our social media accounts from those places. So we, we try hard to provide that type of information. And when we can't specifically, we try to invite people in who can kind of like what you guys do, right? You know, the, this uh, we, we can't all know everything, so we bring in, you know, experts to teach stuff. So, you know, I'm no Nozema expert, but I can bring in someone to our beekeepers who is and let them teach. I'm no overwintering expert, but I can certainly find the person who is and build educational content using their expertise to develop it. So there's lots of ways to partner to satisfy beekeeping, you know, on a national and international scale. Well, that, what you just said is how many bees pass through Florida at some time during the year. And and it really is going to be, behoove you to have healthy bees in Wisconsin so that they can pass through Florida. Absolutely. And, yeah. And that's kind of where I was going was, was uh, helping somebody far away is helping it somebody close to home. So good, yeah, there's no plan. question about that. Yeah. So can we, we do our best. We certainly know there's some limitations. One of the ways that I do it is I speak a lot at state meetings. I was just, I had to do a tally for UF for other purposes, but I've spoken in 37 of the 50 states, you know, so far, a lot of time at state meetings. So it's a really good way to get information out. And I don't know, one of the things that I want to you know point out is that, first of all, you know, we are not going to address the issues that beekeepers are facing alone. I, I sometimes feel like commercial beekeepers feel like they only have each other. I sometimes feel like scientists feel that they only have each other. I sometimes feel that, you know, industry feels that they only have, you know, one another. And one of the things that I'd like to see is for us to bury conspiracy theories and embrace collaboration to address the issues that we as a beekeeping community face. And I think that that is possible. I think that the, the knowledge represented in the beekeepers and the scientists and the extension specialists in, in the magazine editors in the, in, in the hobbyists and the sideline and commercials guys in the industry, I believe we can address the problems that we have. We are greater as a sum. We are greater than the individual problems our bees face. So I, I, I would make an appeal to those listening to, to value partnerships, to value every opportunity you have to work together on behalf of the health of bees. And I think we can get there. I think the answers are in our collective knowledge. We just have to come together and work together to make it happen. And that's a very positive message. I like it. Absolutely. And you've got, you've got a lot of people already working in that direction with all of your supporters and, and collaborators. Pretty impressive. Sure, we're fortunate, but you know, there are a lot of great labs out there in the U.S., a lot of great efforts, you know, the Honeybee Health Coalition, for example. So there's just there's just so many who's interested in, in helping bees. So many, you know, I, I've actually been keeping bees since I was 12, and that was 30 years ago when I started. So people can quickly figure out how old I am. And <laughs> when, when I started keeping bees, which I think is the story for a lot of people, you know, when I started, I always tell people I've been keeping bees longer than keeping bees has been cool right? It's now the cool <laughs> thing to do. And, and I will tell you, I've been watching for three decades now. I've, I've watched us kind of bang our heads up against the wall. And, I, and I've loved watching the growth in our industry, the growth in the number of scientists, the growth in the number of students being created, the, the growth in industries interested in helping bees. And I think we have what it takes to solve our problems. And I'm optimistic that we can come together and do it. And it takes partnerships. I firmly believe that. I think one of your partners, if I'm not, if I'm, if I got this right, you, you work with an organization called Colosk too, correct? Yes, I do, Kim. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great point. Um, 
I, I forget, you know, I've, my mind is among the worst in the world. So I forget absolutely everything. But I will say right about the time that I started working at UF, 2006, 7, 8-ish, is when COLOS came into existence. And that, that's an acronym that stands for Colony, the CO part, Losses, L-O-S-S part. So COLOS, it's Prevention of Honeybee Colony Losses, more affectionately known as COLOS. And COLOS was a group that was funded by the European Union that basically was a networking agency for scientists to come together to address bee health issues. It is an international organization. They have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of members, but a lot of its participants are are Europeans. And I was able to be involved with that early on on the executive committee and and also as an editor of one of their uh, most significant outputs, the Colos Bee Book series. And it was really eye-opening for me to see how the European scientists and then others started coming together to try to do projects that would benefit beekeepers. And it's again, it's it's principally a networking agency where where organization where it brings the scientists together and promotes joint research projects and the pursuit of of addressing these issues. And it was just a great inspiration for me. For me personally. It was good. Professionally, it was good. And it's nice to see what they're doing for bees and beekeepers around the world. And I think we have all the tools in place to do something similar in North America. And I'm, I'm excited about the prospect of, of seeing similar groups or a similar group pop up, even in the U.S. or North America, and, and try to move similar themes forward. You mentioned uh, in passing a little bit ago, that you have a podcast. Why don't you uh, tell us about the podcast? Because it's one of the few podcasts that I actually listen to about beekeepers. I mean, I listen to ours yeah. all the time, but... Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you asking that. Yeah, we... So I've been wanting to start a podcast for a couple years now. And uh, we hired a new extension coordinator back in August of last year, Amy Vu, who, who again, manages our extension programs. And she is the one who kind of embraced it and moved it forward. So we decided to call it two bees in a pod cast, right? You know, two peas in a pod. That's what we're playing (laughs) on. There's always two hosts, kind of like what you guys have. And our original vision was just to try to address topics beekeepers ask us to address. And so we'll put out on our social media accounts, hey, what do you guys want to hear? Who do you want to hear? And we'll invite those interviews will will ask those questions and we'll try to address it and it's similar to your you know beekeeping today podcast we we try hard to address current relevant information for beekeepers a couple of weeks ago we released a podcast on the impacts of covid on the beekeeping industry last week for example we released a podcast about oxalic acid and a few other things just today we released a podcast about this little hornet that you might have heard of, the Asian giant hornet. <laughs> so we, we just try hard to be responsive to our, our audience and, and address what they ask us to address. And one of the things we try hard to is to not be so focused on Florida issues. We, we invite international guests. We've had people from the UK, from Austria, from Greece. You know, we, we're trying to, to bring in expertise from around the world. When, when I travel, when others travel, and we see a good speaker or we hear a good talk that we think would be a benefit to beekeepers, we try to have that person on. Now, it's, it's definitely brand new. It's, we started releasing episodes in January of 2020. I think we're almost not quite at 20 episodes. We try to release one a week. But uh, I've really enjoyed doing it. I, I enjoy podcasts. Uh, one of the things I like about them is that information is just there. Yeah. You record it, you put it up, and it's there, and people can access it, and it just grows and grows and grows over time, and it's been really fun for us, and you, you can find it on any of the standard podcast listening platforms, two Bs and a podcast. Uh, yeah, we, we like it. If, if people struggle to find it, they can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at UF Honeybee Lab, at UF for University of Florida Honeybee Lab. And we do a lot of outreach through our, our social media. So I always tell people, we, we try to provide so much information for beekeepers that they have to stumble over our information to find <laughs> someone else's. Because that, that's, that's our desire is just to, just to help where it's possible, uh, you know, to provide as much reliable information as we can. Yeah, thanks for asking about that. I appreciate oh, you that. bet. You guys do a, a good job, and I was happy to make sure our listeners 
learn about it and and spread the word and uh, encourage our listeners to listen to Two Bees in a Pod cast. And, uh, and <laughs> I, when we were originally doing the logo, I wanted to do Two Bees in a Pod dot 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 cast to kind of be the joke but yeah. what we discovered is right before we launched someone else came online and did two bees in a pod which is unrelated uh, at all yeah, yeah. to bees so you actually have to look for two bees in a podcast, podcast to find us and so they were afraid that if i put the dot 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 cast that it would misdirect people but again you can find it through my my lab's website, ufhoneybee.com, or through our social media at UF Honeybee Lab. Well, I'll make sure there's a, a link to it in our show notes so that they Appreciate can reach that. out. Oh, yeah, you bet. Anything, a little cross-pollination of podcasts is never Absolutely. Hurts. I think it'll benefit benefit us both. We can, <laughs> we can link you guys, and you can link us. I appreciate that. Oh, thanks a lot. Well, Kim, anything else? Uh, I'm glad I'm sitting down. I'm kind of overwhelmed with the amount of information we got here today, Jeff. Uh, Jamie, even this has been really great, Thanks, and Tim. and I'm gonna go play with I'm gonna go play with the BMD for a while. <laughs> see if I can fool it. Well, you you might be able to. Like I said, it's not perfect, but we we want that feedback. Uh, if people if people don't get the answer that they think they should, it, we we want that feedback so we can try to fix that. So play away. Good luck. I will. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Jamie Ellis, for joining us on Beekeeping Today podcast. Look forward to having you back in the future. Kim, Jeff, I really want to thank you guys for having me out today. It's great to be able to talk about what we do. It's a pleasure to be able to speak to your listeners, and I really appreciate you thinking about me. You bet. Well, you take care. Oh, we're glad you could join us. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, that was really good. Now you know what the BMD is. What do you think? Uh, Way cool. (laughs) Way, way cool. I'm impressed uh, to stand there and, and look at it, my, my phone with a picture on it and look at my bees and say, yep, it's the same thing, and then it tells me what to do. Uh, that's, that's, pretty, that's, pretty, that's pretty way cool, I guess. <laughs> but I'll tell you the other thing that, that's going on there. The point that got these people to develop the BMD was, was and he said, it, he said it a couple of times, one of the... The information that they're presenting is beekeeper driven and it's provided because they have because they all embrace collaboration. Mm. Um, in the beekeeping industry, beekeepers are known to be a bunch of loners and kind of stubborn and unchanging. Never to noticed. Hear that kind of language. Yeah. <laughs> to hear that kind of language describing our industry is really, really refreshing. Yeah, it is. Uh, that that is uh, very fun to hear. I, I really enjoy it. I've I've played with it since uh, we talked to Jamie, and and uh, actually this last weekend I had it out uh, on my phone in the in the in the uh, yard. It's very handy. I do look forward to them having an app that is native to yeah. the to the the to the whatever your handheld is. But uh, a gr- great great tool for uh, beekeepers to use. Well, it's another example of if you're going to get information on the Internet, go to the government or a university. Yeah, reliable information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> lots, of, lots of otherwise. Okay, well, that about wraps it up for this episode of Beekeeping Today podcast. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their sponsorship of the Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us your questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, Kim, before we go? No, I think that wraps it up for today, Jeff. Thanks. Thank you. And we'll see you next Monday. See you later.